Thomas Nash is a persona of the Earl of Oxford. How then do we account for universally accepted literary and documentary evidence that he existed? The answer is, we're going to look at it. All right, we're going to examine some literary evidence that Nash, the writer, existed and see if it holds up. Let's ask a question. Was Nash located, arrested, and or imprisoned? He was not. Litchfield depicts Nash in chains. Some biographies have him in the fleet. The state records on the Isle of Dogs affair, however, clear up the issue. In October 1597, the Privy Council released Gabriel Spencer, Robert Shaw, and Ben Johnson from the Marshall Sea. Those were the three people the authorities arrested. Thomas Nash is not mentioned. McCarroll, a, a very careful scholar, wrote the following. It has generally been stated that Nash was actually arrested and sent to the fleet prison, but so far as I can discover, there is not the slightest evidence for this. And he's right. If Nash is Oxford, there's no mystery. The police couldn't apprehend someone who didn't exist. If they found out Nash was an earl, they wouldn't have arrested him. Did Nash have a traceable heritage? He did not. Now, there's some amazing things going on between Nash and Harvey. For one thing, Nash berates Gabriel Harvey for being the son of a rope maker. Well, this is ridiculous. Uh, Nash, according to the Orthodox biography, was the son of a preacher's assistant in a tiny, poor backwater town on the coast. But Harvey never defends himself as the son of a rope, ma rope maker. He should have. He should have said, my father was a success successful businessman who put all three of his kids through college. You know, your father was, was virtually broke at, at what he was doing. But he never said that. Nash claims pedigrees, patrimonies, and illustrious ancestors. Harvey challenges none of it because he knows he's listening to the Earl of Oxford, who did have pedigrees, patrimonies and illustrious ancestors, doesn't reply. He should have said, oh yeah, where are all these great uh, ancestors of yours? In Lytton stuff, Nash is trying to leave a trail and claim he's a real person, and he tells us where to look. He says, my father sprang from the Nashes of Hertfordshire. Well, isn't that convenient? Take a look at the map over there. As you can see, Hertfordshire is all the way to the west, as far as you can go before hitting Wales from Lowestoft. So the translation of his comment is, do you want to investigate my family tree? Fine. Go 240 miles west and explore a 634 square mile area containing 235 parishes. Good friggin' luck. Not surprisingly, quote, nothing is known of the Herefordshire, Herefordshire family. Now, notice they say the family because they just assume it existed, but it didn't, and that's why nothing is known of it. Did Nash stay with his supposed relatives when he traveled up the coast? He did not. Nash passes right through his hometown of Lowestoft and stays in Great Yarmouth, 10 miles further up the coast. Nash, according to documents that we will investigate shortly, had a brother with his family living in Lowestoft and a sister, actually a half-sister, with her family living in Lowestoft. He doesn't even stop to say hello. Now, when a person is fleeing or in trouble or impoverished, he seeks out relatives, and the relatives, no matter who the person is, will take him in. But this did not happen in this case, even though Nash told his readers he was trying to escape from a flat back in London, which we'll also talk about in a moment, he does a stop to see this family. But if you check out Anderson's book, you'll find a passage in there explaining that Oxford's ancestors had history in the area as defenders of the coast. So I think Nat, uh, Oxford had probably been there a few times and was, you know, thinking about the glory of his ancestor defending the coast of England in that area. So he was more comfortable in Great Karma. Nash's trip to Yarmouth actually fits into Oxford's schedule. I think Nash's travels all fit into Oxford's schedule in the gaps. But we're just going to look at this one. If you look at the upper right under Oxford's activities, you'll see that on December 14, 1597, Oxford attended Parliament for the final time. Now, Nelson said, you know, implied, well, Oxford was just lazy and of no account. 
That's why he didn't bother to go the rest of the period. But the opposite is true. He was actually very diligent because he took off on a trip. Actually, Nash claimed he took off on a trip. And when you dig into the explanation of when he left, when he arrived, how long he stayed, the trip was approximately from December 15th to February 8th. And that's why Oxford was not at Parliament for the rest of the session. Why did Oxford undertake the trip? Now, the chronology and the biographies are as follows. Nash is born in Lowestoft. Nash goes to college. Nash visits uh, Great Yarmouth later and so forth. But that's not the real chronology. The real chronology is as follows. In October 1597, Litchfield scoffs, Nash born I know not where. Two months later, Oxford departs for the coast. After his return, Nash announces, I was born in Lowestoft. So Litchfield prompted Oxford to get something on the record about where he was born, and he took a trip, partly to get information so he could write Lenten stuff, and partly to leave a trail that Nash really existed, and he could come back and say he was born there. Now we're going to look at the documentary evidence that suggests Nash was a real person. Some people have said, well, you can't argue that Nash is a persona of the Earl of Oxford unless you take care of the documentary evidence. Well, let's see if we can do that. This is a pretty tough nut to crack, so stay with me, all right? Let's ask the question, do we really have a picture of Thomas Nash? My answer is, well, not likely. On the left, we have a cartoon of Robert Greene. On the far right, we have a cartoon of William Shakespeare. Both of them are voices of the Earl of Oxford. They didn't really exist as writers. And in the middle, we have a cartoon of Thomas Nash. Well, if you read the latest large biography on Nash, written by Nichol, you will find the following sentence. This picture was undoubtedly cut by someone who knew Nash by sight. Well, there's no evidence for that statement. He just made it up. Why, why would that be true? It doesn't particularly look exactly like a person, a specific person. And in fact, that claim is demonstrably false because Litchfield himself says he doesn't know anything personally about Thomas Nash. So if he drew the cartoon, uh, he made it up. If he got someone else or commissioned someone to do it, that person would have come back and at least had some information about Mr. Nash but Litchfield had none. So I think we can say it was undoubtedly cut by someone who never saw Nash by sight. There were three entries in Henslow's diary about Thomas Nash, and when I first read about these, it was in an article about Thomas Nash that did not tell the whole story, and I was a little bit perturbed. So I studied the entries, and I found there were problems with them. We're not going to go through all of them, but one for certain is that Nash never wrote a single play for Henslow in his life, so what in the world was Henslow doing caring about trying to bail Thomas Nash out of jail? Well, the true answer to this conundrum was that all three entries have been proven to be forgeries by the infamous John Payne Collier. Okay, fine. You can say, well, that gets rid of that evidence, but I argue that, in fact, this is positive evidence that Nash did not exist. Because had he existed, Mr. Collier would have found enough information about him that he wouldn't have had to make something up, but he couldn't find anything, so he had to make up some evidence that Nash actually existed. Are there any records of an early life or education for Thomas Nash? There are not. Nash is utterly invisible until Cambridge records his entry on October 13, 1582. There is nothing. Not just no early education, but actually no record of a life at all. And the fact that he has no recorded early education is actually highly unusual. Records account for the pre-university education of real people whose names are attached to plays. They include Christopher Marlowe, Thomas Lodge, Ben Johnson, William Gager, and George Peel. What's more, there were no grammar schools in or near the two remote villages where Nash's parents resided. And Nash's father was way too poor to own books, and so were the villages. So, where did Nash 
learn enough to impress readers with, quote, a parade of classical learning in his first pamphlet begun when he was supposedly only 19 years old. There is no answer to that. The biographers don't give us an answer to that. But if Nash is Oxford, there again is no mystery. We know that Oxford had a hell of an education and he could issue a, par a pamphlet that showed off a parade of classical learning. Guess who else had no recorded education? Two other voices who didn't exist as writers, Robert Greene and William Shakespeare. We should ask the question, was Nash really at St. John's? Well, Robert Greene and Thomas Nash both emerged from nowhere. They had no prior record of existence to matriculate as Sizars at the same Cambridge College the Earl of Oxford attended, St. John's. Well, some people might just shrug that off and say, ah, so what? You know, they just showed up at, at uh, Cambridge and happened to go into that college. But let's look at the odds of that happening. In 1580, there were 14 colleges at Cambridge, 18 colleges at Oxford. That's a total of 32 colleges. The probability that both writers suspected of non-existence entered the same college Oxford did is a thousand to one. And that's if we don't even consider the fact that these two guys have no record of an early education. How many students enter these colleges with no record of an early education? The odds are actually much more uh, negative than a thousand to one. So this leads us to a question. Might the college records have been fabricated? I think we can answer that question in the positive. And it's because of testimony from Gabriel Harvey that there was no Thomas Nash at Cambridge. Now you have to understand that Gabriel Harvey was active and prominent at both Oxford and Cambridge. His involvement with Cambridge lasted nearly 20 years, 1566 to 1585. Nash supposedly matriculated in 1582 and received a BA in 1586, overlapping Harvey's time there by a full three years. Yet Harvey firmly declares that Nash is, quote, one whom I never heard of before. And Harvey, of course, was also acquainted with contemporary men of letters, yet the only Thomas Nash he says he knew was a Cambridge butler who had that name. Well, let's ask some questions. How could Thomas Nash have spent three years alongside Harvey at Cambridge, been a real-life man of letters, and still be utterly unknown to Gabriel Harvey. I say it is virtually impossible. Therefore, the college records are almost certainly not genuine. Along those lines, we have to ask, did Thomas Nash participate in a show at college as you will also read in Nash's biographies? He did not. Here's the story and the trimming of Thomas Nash an author uh, going under the Alan M. Richard Litchfield claims that Nash participated in a show called Terminus at Non-Terminus while at college and dropped out as a result. There is no documentary evidence for that claim. Moreover, and the scholar put it very precisely, Harvey, who would have certainly heard of Nash's disgrace and would have made the most of it, says not a word on the subject. The show never occurred. Had it occurred, Harvey would be, be rating Nash up and down for having done it. But the trimming came out in 1597, which was after Harvey stopped writing pamphlets and arguing with Thomas Nash, and that's why it's never mentioned by him. Orthodoxy doesn't know the players. Richard Litchfield is actually an alonym of someone named Joseph Hall, who was a student at Cambridge when the pamphlet came out. I wrote an article about this for the January 2023 De Beer Society newsletter. Please check it out if you want to see why Litchfield didn't write it and Joseph Hall did. So what we actually have here is Joseph Hall pretending to be Richard Litchfield, addressing the Earl of Oxford who was pretending to be Thomas Nash. And he's talking about a show because he's actually creating a metaphor about Oxford's voices which we can talk about in the question period if you're interested. Or you could just read my Thomas Nash chapter in Oxford's Voices when we talk about that. 
All right, we're going to skip over now to some more, uh, let's say, seemingly convincing documentary evidence. There was an official summons for Thomas Nash to appear, but it produced nobody. The aldermen of London took umbrage at the insinuations made in Christ's tears, and they issued a summons dated November 20th, 1593. Item, Thomas Nash and John Snow need to appear at the next, next sessions of Newgate. Nash never showed up. What we find out is that Nash escapes due to, quote, the timely interference of George Carey, bearing Nash away with him to the Isle of Wight to spend Christmas. Well, isn't that convenient? But consider this. When authorities sought Thomas Kidd, they found him and tortured him. When authorities sought Christopher Marlowe, they found him. And if you believe the latest work on this, they killed him. When authorities sought Ben Johnson, they found him and locked him up three times. When authorities sought three authors of the Isle of Dogs, they found and arrested them. In April, May 1593, the year of Christ's tears, we discover that authorities apprehended, tried, and executed three men for seditious words and seditious books. So they were very, very active. They could find who they wanted, and they got rid of them. Of the ten people we're talking about on this page, nine of them faced mortal danger for their words, and five were killed. But Nash spent the holidays in a castle. If Nash is Oxford, there's no mystery. Initially, the aldermen did not know who Thomas Nash was. They only had his name on a pamphlet. When they learned who he really was, they dropped the inquiry. And notice there's a little bit of time. If we go back a slide, we'll see that the summons was dated November 20th, and then Oxford slash Nash went to the Isle of Wight for Christmas. I'm pretty sure in the intervening weeks, he met with the aldermen and said, look, guys, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll take that passage out in the next edition, which is exactly what happened in the next edition of 1594. We also have a complaint letter dated 1593. It doesn't name Nash, but it mentions one of his works. Only two men complained officially of Nash, and neither one of them contacted the censors. Instead, they wrote to, guess who? Oxford's father-in-law. A Puritan member of the Privy Council, Robert Beale, wrote to Lord Burley on March 17, 1593, to complain about a passage denigrating Danes, in Pierce Penniless and to request its suppression. He doesn't name the author. The result is that Burley ignored it. Well, of course he did. You know, his son-in-law was writing this stuff. He wasn't going to go tell him to shut up. Who was Robert Beale to tell Lord Burley and Earl of Oxford what to do? But that's not the most amazing part of this. Incredibly, Nash was given access to Beale's private letter. In Lenten stuff, we are told by a scholar, Nash speaks of an infant squib of the Inns of Court, a statesman who peruses one of his pamphlets and complains in terms close to Beale's letter to Burley. Okay, several questions. Wait a minute, he's calling a member of the Privy Council, this 25-year-old Garrett Liver, who's writing a few pamphlets, he calls him an infant squib? Where does he even come up with that thought? But we can certainly see our guy, the uh, rather privileged Earl of Oxford, looking down on a member of the Privy Council who was complaining about his pamphlet, calling him an infant squib. Now, here's another interesting thing. I think we learn a lot about the Earl of Oxford when, he study, when we study the works by his voices. Um, Nash looks down on Beale as a statesman. He's a member of the Privy Council. Bonner Cutting recently demonstrated that Oxford was never a member of the Privy Council. And here he's speaking down about a person on the Privy Council. I think we've just learned something here, and that is the reason why Oxford was never in the Privy Council. It wasn't because the Queen didn't think he was worthy. It's because Oxford thought the Privy Council wasn't worthy of him. The Privy Council advised the government. And I'll bet in Oxford mind, he said, I am part of the government. I don't need to be on the advisory board. And 
Ask yourself, would the Lord Treasurer of England have sought out Thomas Nash in the ghetto and handed him or had a, someone hand him Beale's letter? It never would have happened in a million years. Or did Burley simply pass the letter on to his son-in-law? And that's exactly what happened here. Now, there was an official reference to Nash's lodging in papers, and when I first came across this, I said, oh, this is a problem. I mean, you know, it was there in Nash who actually had lodging in papers. Well, after the Isle of Dogs incident, the Privy Council directed spymaster Richard Topcliffe to peruse such papers as were found in Nash's lodging, which Ferris, a messenger of the chamber, will deliver. Well, the first thing we find out is that there were no ensuing records or reports. The pursuit of Nash just stops. And then, reading a little further, I found out a reason why, if Nash is Oxford, there is no mystery. The earliest dated official record of the Isle of Dogs affair is a letter from Topcliffe to Lord Burley, dated August 10, 1597, giving him advance notice of the investigation. All Burley had to do was send a timely word to his son-in-law, and he could have arranged whatever he wanted to arrange or disarrange whatever he wanted to disarrange. Okay, now we're getting down to Nash's family. There are pa parish records of a Nash family in Lowestoft. Wait, you say? We've always been told there was a Nash family in Lowestoft. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. I had to read like five biographies, and it wasn't until the appendix of the last one where I found out that actually, no, there's no Nash family in Lowestoft. There is a Nash family in Lowestoft. There was William Nash, there was his wife Margaret Nash, and their children Mary Israel and Thomas Nash. There's some issues with the records, which I'm not going to go into, but these are the names cited. The difference is the same as the way Shakespeare relates to Shakespeare, and it's because there are two different either people or conceptions. Nicol confessed the difference. Quote, a pun of Richard Litchfield's, however, implies that Nash rhymes with Ash. Well, of course it does, because there was a common spelling of Nash's name as Nash without the E. The Nash family lived in Lowestoft, but Thomas Nash supposedly, lived in Cambridge and London. No record proves they were related. Now, Margaret, the supposed mother of Thomas Nash, left a will. And again, I paused when I, I saw this fact, and I said, well, you know, this, this seems like something important. Well, Nickel reported that he found, quote, nothing very unusual about the will of Thomas Nash's supposed mother. I don't know why he put in the word very Apparently, there was something somewhat unusual about it, but he didn't mention what it was. But my answer is, are you kidding? There are several problems with this will in the Orthodox context. First, Margaret provides no identifier for Thomas. Now, Thomas supposedly, li supposedly lived well over 100 miles away, but she doesn't tell the executor where he is. She doesn't say, Thomas, my son who lives in London, or, you know, the Cambridge graduate who is now writing uh, pamphlets down in London. She doesn't identify. Uh, it's as if the executor should know right where he is and, and how to get the stuff to him that he inherited. Number two, the will says that Thomas has an older brother, Israel. Well, that's interesting because Nash never mentioned an older brother or any brother at all, or a sister for that matter. Well, Margaret left Thomas household items. Isn't that nice? But one of them was a feather bed. How would Thomas Nash of London have been expected to retrieve or even care to retrieve a feather bed from 143 miles away? Nash couldn't even afford the bus fare, according to his own testimony, to get there, much less could he, could he have afforded a cart to drag the stuff all the way down from low stuff to London, and why would he have wanted this feather bed anyway? This is better evidence that Margaret Thomas is not the writer than that he is. If the will is real, and I'm not going to contest that, although I think one might go about trying, her Thomas must have been a local lad whose whereabouts the executor knew and who could have carted away the household stuff he inherited. 
Okay, this is we're getting into even deeper into into difficult things to explain, but we're going to find out that they are not only explicable, but they are gloriously so. There is a personal letter from George Carey to his wife, dated November 13, 1593. It's a private letter, so there seems to be no reason why Carey would lie to her. But in the letter, he declares that his friend Nash had been clapped in the fleet for writing Christ's tears, and he's got to stay behind to bail him out. We know, however, that Nash was never jailed. The summons for Nash, in fact, didn't go out until a week later, so it's impossible to fit the fake jailing of Nash even into the actual call for him to appear. So what in the world is going on? We're going to figure this out. Two independent scholars brought the scenario into crystal clarity. Now, both of these scholars thought Nash was real, so they're certainly not working for me. Rita Lamb discerned Carrie's motive, she writes. He comes up with four good reasons why he can't return home. I think that's three excuses too many. And a scurrilous lampoon a few years later suggests that if Lady Elizabeth worried about her husband's quote-unquote business trips, away from her she had good reason. She goes on to say that among his excuses... The queen learned he'd arrived, and before he knew it, he was agreeing to stay for the Accession Day celebrations on November 17th, an event, we are told by another source, to be attended by many beautiful ladies, men, women, and girls. Carey's claim about Nash is the last of his four excuses. He said, I'm so sorry, dear, but I gotta stay behind and party. Well, here's another fascinating aspect of Carey's letter. As it turns out, he writes like Thomas Nash writes. Duncan Jones noticed a close affinity between the writing in Carey's letter and that of Guess Who. Carey shows a Nash-like relish for strongly physical and tactile images, such as rub my horse heels, and for coined compound adjectives such as comedy tragedical. The letter also may contain a literary allusion to Friar Alfonso about whom Nash tells a funny story in Pierce Penalists. Carey also employs verse-like constructions, a polyptaton, and a conceit about his multiple commitments, which hath made an university in my brains, an elision of academic and legal disputation. In short, George Carey emulates Thomas Nash in rhetoric, poetic expression, coining boisterous words, and creating sophisticated metaphors. Yet Carey never published a word of creative literature in his life. All that he wrote were bureaucratic memos. So what is going on? We've got a little bit more to explore. Equally curiously, Carey's letter slips into the third person speaking of his delay and things not in his power, and so forth. Equally intriguingly, Duncan Jones recorded two impressions of rapid writing. Quote, the final list of games in court has been scribbled very hastily. The opening phrase is rather blotted and confused. What explains Carey's writing in Nash's style, the use of third person, and rushed writing? Carey was taking dictation. From whom was he taking dictation? Well, my horse's heels shows up in Shakespeare's Henry VI, Part One, and comedy tragical shows up in Shakespeare's Hamlet as tragical comical. He was taking dictation from Shakespeare, i.e. he was taking dictation from the Earl of Oxford. The Earl of Oxford and his buddy, George Carey were getting ready to go to a giant party and Oxford was pacing back and forth behind him saying, write this down in your letter to your wife. I'll dictate it. You, you scribble as fast as you can. We'll get rid of this thing and we'll be ready to go. And the last excuse he came up with was having to rescue poor Tom Nash from jail. Okay, so we're now down to one item. A handwritten letter to William Cotton from 1596. 
It was discovered by John Payne Collier, and initially I figured, okay, this has got to be another forgery by the man. I, well, I was wrong about that. And I had to rethink the whole thing. But it looked pretty scary when I first came across it. You know, oh my gosh, is this a handwritten letter by Thomas Nash? And, you know, everything that I've discovered goes out the window. Well, first of all, we find some really weird things about this letter. It was found among the papers of Robert Cotton, who was not related to any William Cotton at all. So he wasn't a relative of William Cotton. We know of several William Cottons. The one that most people think the letter was addressed to is the William Cotton, who was uh, George Carey's man and who George Carey said he was going to send to get Nash out of the fleet. But they're not related. And you would think if the letter was received by William Cotton, it would have been discovered years later among um, stuff left behind by Cotton or more likely George Carey or Carey's family, but it wasn't. It was found in the, in the material left behind by Robert, who happened to be head of a huge library. He was an antiquarian, and he would have been the perfect person to preserve something if you wanted it to last a few hundred years. Anyway, we also have no signature at the bottom of the letter. Uh, very curiously torn away just where the signature should appear. Um, but the text is clearly designed to imply Nash, so I'm fine with saying, yeah, Nash, Nash wrote it, or it was supposed to be by him. You read the letter, you find something interesting. There's not a single personal comment in the letter. He's supposed to be writing to a buddy, in fact, a commenter buddy. And he doesn't say, hey, thanks a lot, Will, for coming and bailing me out of the fleet. That sure was great. We had a good time over at the tavern, you know, afterwards. Uh, that was great. It was good to chat up your boss, George, you know. But he doesn't say anything like that. The letter reads as manufactured literature. Nearly every line can be traced to text from Nash's books. As just one example, and I, I list several in, in the Nash chapter of my book, but Nash's title, Purse Panelist, echoes in his line, I have ne'er a penny in my purse, and all of it's like that. And as we are about to discover, the letter fits Oxford's authorship better than Nash's. And this is the key point. The letter makes use of legal phraseology, indicating that the law was an integral part of the writer's mind. You will not find... This comment in biographies, because they skip over it. It was discovered by an E.D. Macarness and written up in 1949. He wrote, The first simile, as unfortunate as a term at St. Albans to poor country clients, is followed by a mention of Jack Cade's dealing with lawyers, and he uses other legal terms in speaking of the proclamation out of date and the ribald bequest of Gilliam of Brentford, Sure, I had been of his counsel. He should have set for the mot or word before it. And he recalls an old inns of court trick. The letter concludes with a legal phrase, yours in acknowledgment of deepest pond. Now that is seven legalisms in a one-page letter. Shakespeare averages about 70 legalisms per play. Now, someone might try to behave as Stratfordians do and say, well, he must have picked it up somewhere. You know, maybe he was hanging around the ends of court. That will not fly. Oxfordian's own Ramon Jimenez has made a career out of figuring out and discovering when Oxford wrote the Shakespeare precursor plays, the plays that were written better in later years. He just figured out when they were written greatly on the basis of how many legal references they contain. And if they contain few or none, he dated them to prior to 1567 when Oxford entered Gray's Inn. And if they have a lot of them, they were written after 1568 when he finished his legal education. So consider the fact that Oxford was one of the most educated human beings on the planet in 1566. And yet, when he wrote plays, he never brought in legalisms. It was only after his law studies that he began to use them. So we can't say, oh, Nash just picked it up. This is a very important aspect of the letter that Thomas Nash supposedly wrote. And keep in mind, as I, as I read that quote, the writer even implies that he could provide legal counsel. 
In other words, he's as knowledgeable as a, law, as a lawyer. Nothing in Nash's biography accounts for this claim. In fact, Nash didn't even have time to study law. Uh, he graduated supposedly in 1588, started writing in 1589, so he had no time to become a lawyer or learn the law. If Nash is Oxford once again and for the final time, there is no mystery. Nash was just a literary creation, so Oxford, in writing this letter, used the language of his literary creation. Legal references flow as naturally from Nash as from Shakespeare because they are the same person. Oxford created the letter because he wanted to leave behind evidence of Nash's actuality, which he also did when he went to Lowestoft. Oxford's motive, I think, is pretty clear. We can ask why did he leave behind more documentary evidence for Nash than for other invented voices, such as Robert Cream and William Shakespeare? Well, I think there are three good reasons. Oxford's persona caused a ruckus effect twice, making people curious as to his person. Harvey and Litchfield were publicly trying to draw him out. Oxford would have wanted posterity, and I think this is the most important reason, to believe that a real independent writer was defending the Earl of Oxford and the quote-unquote deceased Robert Greene against the Harveys. All it really took for Oxford to provide an impression of Nash's actuality were four things. A few college records, which we've discussed. Brief notes in the margin of two books. We didn't talk about those, but they're easily accounted for. A letter sounding like Thomas Nash, which we did talk about, and a trip up the coast to locate, or perhaps embellish, or maybe even invent, the Nash family records. I th I'm perfectly happy to say there was a Nash family and that all he did was locate those records. Now, we have talked about why the Earl of Oxford uh, is the true pers person behind the Nash persona. We've talked about many, many ways that Nash's biography makes no sense. Um, and we've shown that the documentary evidence really doesn't show that there was an independent individual named Thomas Nash roaming around London. Um, I'm going to add one more comment about that. There is only one non-literary mention of Nash as a person. It was the other complaint. I mentioned there were two complaints. Well, the second one was in 1594, Hugh Broughton complained in a letter, again, to Oxford's father-in-law, about ridicule from, from Whitgift's Nash gentleman, as he put it. He didn't say it in a natural way. He didn't say from Tom Nash or from that lousy pamphleteer, Tom Nash. He spoke about him as the Nash, that Nash gentleman. I think it's equivalent to saying Whitgift's twain gentleman. They both knew about whom he was talking, and once again, just as in the first instance, Burley did absolutely nothing. But otherwise... And this is important. No person, court, or office left a painting, a letter, a memo, a memoir, a bill, a payment, a lease, a contract, a legal proceeding, a marriage record, or a burial record attesting to the existence of the popular writer Thomas Nash. Now, this is amazing because the biographers will, biographers will tell you that he was a man about town. He was everywhere. You have to read them to understand how widely they claim he, he roamed around and he rubbed elbows with nobility and with the lowest people who lived on streets where prostitutes hung out. But no record at all. Contrast this to the fact that records indicating a real person do exist for the real people. That include Thomas Lodge, George Peel, Christopher Marlowe, Edmund Spencer, Will Shakespeare but not for Thomas Nash, and also, by the way, not for Robert Greene. I think those are completely invented, although we may have borrowed the name from, from somebody locally. There was no indication of anybody who could even fill the shoes. Even Thomas Nash, the butler of Pembroke Hall, is on record as having been involved in a college legal proceeding in 1598. So if even the butler named Thomas Nash has a documentary record of his existence, but the Thomas Nash the, Nash, the writer, does not. And that shows you how unusual it is that we cannot find any valid evidence of Thomas Nash as a person. All right. 
I'm going to uh, wrap things up by talking a little bit about Dido, Queen of Carthage, which was a play published in 1594 after Christopher Marlowe died. It was billed as being by Christopher Marlowe and Thomas Nash. If you read most of the uh, critics on this, they all just brush off Thomas Nash, say, ah, he probably didn't have much to do with it. This is a Christopher Marlowe play. Well, it's not. Uh, I've read it. The first two acts sound like Christopher Marlowe, and the act three through five, five sound like Shakespeare. In other words, Thomas Nash. I think what happened was Marlowe was half partway through the play when he was killed. Um, Oxford ended up digging through his papers, uh, and he found a partially completed play, Dido, Queen of Carthage. He finished it off himself and put Thomas's Nash, Thomas Nash's name on the cover as the second writer. Now, I'm sure many of you uh, know Shakespeare backwards and forwards. Some of you might have read Marlowe and contrasted his style of writing with Shakespeare's. But I'm going to read a passage from this play. It occurs in the fifth act. I personally think this is more poignant than anything in Venus and Adonis, even, or Lucrece. It's an amazing piece of writing, and it's 100% Shakespeare. Tell me what you think. This is Dido. She's beside herself because Aeneas is leaving. She says, Now looks Aeneas like immortal Jove. Oh, where is Ganymede to hold his cup and Mercury to fly for what he calls? Ten thousand cupids hover in the air and fan it in Aeneas' lovely face. Oh, that the clouds were here wherein thou fleest, that thou and I unseen might sport ourselves. Heavens, envious of our joys, is waxen pale, and when we whisper, then the stars fall down to be partakers of our honey talk. Oh, that I had a charm to keep the winds within the closure of a golden ball. Let me go. Farewell. I must from hence. These words are poison to poor Dido's soul. Oh, speak like my Aeneas, like my love. Why lookst thou toward the sea? The time hath been when Dido's beauty chained thine eyes to her. Am I less fair than when thou saw me first? Oh, Anna, Anna, I will follow him. How can ye go when he hath all your fleet? I'll frame me wings of wax like Icarus, and o'er his ships will soar unto the sun, that they may melt, and I fall in his arms. That is not Christopher Marlowe. It's not even Thomas Nash. That's pure Shakespeare. So did Thomas Nash exist? He did not. Was Nash a persona of the Earl of Oxford? He was. By the way, this is only an excerpt from the Thomas Nash chapter. As you can imagine, the chapter is actually as long as a 300-page book, so I had to pick and choose what I was going to show you today. There's so much more and, and so many more fun things to learn about Thomas Nash in there. I, I hope you'll read it sometime and give me your feedback. You can write me at bob at oxfordsvoices.com. Thank you, Bob. We have a book club, which is free and will continue through the summer. And you can find information on that at our website, shakespeareauthorship.org, through the events page. Here we go. Did Oxford write all of Nash's early satires and Henry the Sixth? Nash always writes of his poverty and mistreatment by Pembroke's. Was that Oxford? I think Oxford wrote all of the Nash oeuvre. In fact, when I started, I thought there might be two people involved because, you know, he's going along kind of grousing about people in his pamphlets and and uh, and sort of wielding this flashy pen. And then suddenly out of the blue, he writes this uh, Calvinist tract called Christ Tears. I'm like, this is crazy. You know, what's this about? And then I realized, oh, wait a minute, Robert Greene did the same thing. At the end of his supposed life, he suddenly, you know, re renounces all of his love pamphlets and he writes these Calvinist tracts. Even Thomas Lodge, and I think Oxford wrote Thomas Lodge's work, did exactly the same thing. He was writing uh, beautiful stories. One is, one is the basis of As You Like It, and it's so fun and wonderful to read. And then he starts into these Calvinist rants. All three of his voices did exactly the same thing later in their life. 
point is, yeah, he wrote it all as far as I know. Lily asks, this work on Nash addresses an aspect of the 2005 paper by Stephanie Hopkins Hughes that invites us and Oxfordians to expand the authorship theory to include the problematic biographies of other commoner writers who may have covered for other court writers. Do you have a thought about other writers such as Robert Greene and John Lilly? And if so, who's doing this research? Stephanie's quote was so great. She had a beautiful line in there, which I quoted right at the beginning of the, of the wits portion of my book. And yeah, she was an early pioneer. In fact, uh, Stephanie is one of the reasons I went off on this uh, journey because she uh, argued way back in 1997 or eight that Robert Greene was a voice of the Earl of Oxford. I had also done some work on, on a puzzle relating to the uh, cover of Shakespeare's sonnets and I found these names in there and I would find Thomas Nash and Robert Greene and, and uh, William Warner and, and I would say, what are these names doing in here? And the real people's names, I eventually figured out later, were not in there. Christopher Marlowe wasn't in there. And Spencer, Edmund Spencer wasn't in there. But the voices' names just kept popping up. So a lot of things uh, kicked it off. And one thing led to another. The most fascinating part to me was so many clues came in foot, orthodox footnotes. You read the stuff, and then they put in a footnote. Oh, by the way, this was a common phrase that was used by these four different people. And of course, I would put that aside and say, I need to check these other three people. And eventually that led me to find out, you know, it was not a common phrase because all the real writers didn't use it. I mean, but, but Oxford did. And, and I want people to understand one thing. At the end of the book, I've got a couple of hundred pages discussing people that I think were independent writers. And I included all the poets, all the uh, prose story writers, and all the playwrights. And made my cases for why all of them were independent from the voices. So... I originally thought I would be done in two years, and, and I realized I can't do this unless I can contrast that. And I think that was another point that Stephanie Hughes made. You couldn't just, you know, make a claim because uh, some people talked about footprints. Well, they don't work because not only do the or fingerprints, I guess it was, not only do the fingerprints have to match, but you can't have a single fingerprint that doesn't. Like I said at the beginning, of, you know, a single fact can overthrow your your idea, and if there were one fact that didn't fit. I said, he's not a voice. Frank Grail asks, does Michael Drayton fit into any of this? Drayton was one of, I've got a long section on those who knew. And Drayton is among them. But no, he was never a voice of Oxford's, in my opinion. And he also asked, who is the T. Nash that lived from 1567 to 1601? That's, that's our guy. The T. Nash, who supposedly was born in 67, and by the way, I said the records of the Lowstadt family, the Nash family, are a little bit problematic. He's the only kid where they don't list a date. They just put the month. So I think there could have been a Tom Nash born in, in Lowstadt in November 1567, but nobody died in 1601. You see it in the biographies just because they don't hear anything else from him, because just like Robert Greene, he just retired and then stopped using the name after he published uh, the play. Uh, Summer's Last Will. So yeah, there was no death. Frank also asked, that's a lot for Devere to take on two personas and to write two authors' bibliographies. Oh, I hate to I hate to make uh, myself look like, you asked where people were from originally when you started out. Well, it's going to sound like I'm from another planet <laughs> because it wasn't just two voices. I count approximately 150. Oh, wow. Now, most, most of them are not prolific. Uh, most of them are one-offs. He wrote many, many things where, you know, some neighbor of his or somebody he knew or from the Cambridge Rolls or something like that, he would use a name and uh, write a narrative poem and put it on the person's name. And then you found out the person never wrote another thing in his life. <laughs> you find it, try to find traces of him and there's no biography. And it was just something he made up. So I think he was, and Jonathan Foss is, is very big on this. In fact, Stephanie is as well about what geniuses do. And one thing they do is they just work their asses off. They don't stop. They love what they're doing so much. And I think Oxford was writing constantly and looking around for a name to publish something under. And here's another cool thing. Uh, one of the reasons that this stuff survives is that Oxford wrote it. If some unknown person wrote a poem, it's kind of doubtful he would have paid to get it published, you know, and have it out there and never follow up. But Oxford had the money, so he could get everything published that he wrote. 
I think the reason he did it was to demonstrate that Elizabethan England was as prolific and full of artistic people as ancient uh, Athens and ancient Rome. William Corbett asks, why add Nash's name to Dido? It could have just as easily been left off as just Marlowe, or better still, Marlowe and Shakespeare. Marlowe was, was a, uh, a rival. And when Tamburlaine came out and fascinated everybody, I think he was annoyed. And you can see it in some of the writing of, that Robert Greene, when Robert Greene talks about Tamburlaine, he's, he's, he's pissed off. Hey, hey, I write stuff just as well as that. Oxford viewed his own contribution to Dido as superior to Marlowe's, so he slapped one of his voices' names on it. Cheryl Egan Donovan says, in whose hand do you think the 1596 letter to William Cotton was written? I don't push that, but I do think there are many letters, individual letters, formed in there that are identical to uh, letters as they are formed in Oxford's tin letters. He may have written it. It's possible he dictated it. I actually think he wrote it. Alex has been doing some work on Pessoa, who is a uh, Portuguese writer who had several what they call heteronyms because he made them seem like real people. And he's got a thousand page book about the guy and he looked over some of the handwritten stuff and he found that Pessoa's personas each had their own handwriting style. So I think Oxford as a man of letters could have scribbled out a letter that looked a little bit rough to fit the persona that he was uh, claiming to be. But I don't hang any hats on it as far as I'm concerned. If he had a secretary there and was pacing back and forth dictating it, just like he did with George Carey's letter, that's fine with me. Evan Hughes says, how do you explain the Pembrokes, Mary Sidney and her husband, the Earl, supporting Nash and then cutting him off and his subsequent denouncing them? Or her. He never denounced them that I know of. Um, what he did was he helped um, get some sonnets published of Philip Sidney. He involved a man named Thomas Newman. I think he handed the stuff to Thomas Newman and Thomas Newman decided on his own to include some additional sonnets, which he put under the initials SD for Samuel Daniel, who actually was a voice for one play, but they turned out to be Oxford's. And I think Oxford hit the roof when he saw that. So he was very embarrassed. There's a, a section in my book, what I, which I just love, and I call it 35 Dogs Who Didn't Bark. It's all in the um, Samuel Daniel chapter. Jonathan Foss says, do you believe that Oxford used Nash and Robert Greene like he did George Peel as walking around name to be incognito, to sending letters, signing for play payments, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. I think he, he posed as those people. Uh, and I think he posed as Shakespeare when he was acting. And, and none of the others. I don't think he posed as any of the others. But we, I'm sure that he posed as, as George Peel because he wrote a letter to Lord Burley about that. And I wrote a couple of articles about it. We talked about it in a, in a previous uh, discussion. And Robert Greene is kind of obvious. Uh, and I think he collected a payment. In, under that name from the Earl of Leicester. There's a record of that. But Thomas Nash, we know, I know, I think I know that he posed as Nash because he's the guy who went down to Croydon in November, was it 1592, to write the, uh, the play for, for the Archbishop. And that's when uh, that guy complained about what gives Nash gentlemen making fun of him. Now, this, this guy was a churchman and he was a, a weirdo. He had weird um, theories about the Bible and stuff, and it drove Whitgift crazy. And of course, Oxford's there to side, helping berate this guy and probably entertaining everyone in the household as he was berating him, just like he did with uh, Malvolio or something like that. So the guy was really annoyed and he wrote that letter to Lord Burley and complained about it. He called him Whitgift's Nash gentleman. So yeah, he was posing, but everybody knew who was there. He was calling himself, you know, like Twain at the moment. Mark Mendiza asks, just to be clear, could you state Devere's precise motive for all of this? I already did one, and I think that's a more important one, but there, there's a, a one that, you know, nobility was supposed to be defending the realm. Their big deal was they were supposed to be military people and politicians. And in fact, that was the thing that annoyed Oxford about Harvey, because in 1578, he gave a speech and he said all these wonderful things about uh, De Beer, but then he also kind of cajoled him and he said, you know, you should put your pen down and pick up a sword and start fighting for England. 
which really annoyed Oxford. And I think that's why he was pissed off at Harvey for years after that and berated him under at least a half a dozen different names. Uh, several were obvious pseudonyms like Double V. People of the nobility felt that uh, being a man of letters, particularly a playwright, and especially an actor, if he was an actor, which I think he was from time to time, it was absolutely demeaning to the position. But the other one, and I think this is more important, and I think this is why the queen decided to pay him a thousand pounds a year, and that he was glorifying her reign. Elizabeth in England is still beloved by many, many people, and it's because of Shakespeare's plays, and also because they defeated the Armada, mostly because of Shakespeare and his plays and his poems. And I think he was, he's, he was saying, I want the world to believe that our culture is as rich as that of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Uh, you had some brilliant people like Marlowe and Spencer you know, adding their contributions, and I think they were inspired by the Earl of Oxford. And then you have probably another 100 or, you know, I mean, I counted about 300 people who were, you know, adding things themselves. They just weren't geniuses and weren't very good at it. Uh, David Richardson asks, Nash apparently offended Mary Sidney with the preface to Astrophil and Stella, tried to apologize and then entered into an extended quarrel documented by Gabriel Harvey. It is hard to fit this into the ongoing contention between the Sidneys and Oxford. Could you speak to how you see that relationship evolving? Harvey speaks of a, of a gentlewoman. That's not Mary Sidney. That's a misconception. It's led to all kinds of extrapolations of who hated whom and all that sort of thing. He was talking about someone else, even if whether the person was real, I don't know. Harvey didn't know the Countess, as far as I could tell. Uh, but I discussed that over several pages because it's a little bit complicated and it's certainly not something we could start right here. But, you know, I do cover that. So I tried, I tried to investigate every mystery there is of the period and work it in in the chapter where it belongs. You can easily search through the book. It's very searchable. You can find whatever term you're looking for. You can start with that Harvey, uh, Harvey's Gentlewoman and you'll find it. And uh, you'll find what I have to say. And if you agree, fine. If you don't, uh, let me know why. Robert Greene's death and burial was announced by Gabriel Harvey in a letter to a friend. However, no record of Greene's burial has been found. Please clarify. It started with uh, Greene himself saying, I'm on my deathbed, you know, and, and uh, you know, my poor suffering wife and my kid and Fortunatus and all that sort of thing. Well, Har Harvey had threatened Robert Greene because of what he wrote in Quip for an Upstart Courtier, where he had Harvey's father berate all three of his own sons. And it, it's, it's hilarious. Of course, Harvey's his head is exploding with this horrible stuff. And so when he, he threatened Robert Greene with a lawsuit. And so Oxford, in the middle of Grotesworth, he's writing one of his usual, you know, love is, is dangerous pamphlets. And suddenly in the middle, he gets the word that Harvey's going to you know, file a lawsuit against Robert Greene. So he says, I got to, I got to kill this guy off. So he start, oh, I repent everything I've written. And, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll never do this again. And oh my God, you know, and then he's getting sick and he's on it. He writes the repentance on his deathbed. And then he found another pamphlet in, in the, in the cubby that he said, oh, I need to get this out. And, and so he, that one he put out written at the instant of his death. And it wasn't even in the same realm as the other things. So then Harvey realized what had happened. He said, oh my gosh, I can't sue him anymore, but I'm going to have some fun with this. So he wrote an even bigger burlesque of the death. And he has girlfriend is, is a prostitute and she's the sister of Cutting Ball. And it's like saying, you know, it's Charles Manson's porn star sister. He just goes <laughs> way off and has a ball, you know. And here's one of the great things about it. poor Gabriel Harvey was actually a funny guy. And he was a righteous guy, too, because, I mean, Oxford was just shredding his family and, and really kind of being unfair. And Harvey was annoyed, but his hands were tied behind his back. And history thinks that this guy was an ogre for beating up a poor dead Robert Green. How could he do such a terrible thing? <laughs> well, Green wasn't dead at all. And Harvey himself said, I am not those that bite the dead. He's still alive, but he couldn't come out and tell the whole truth. And that's why Nash slaughtered him. Jonathan Foss says, you said today that there are very few contemporary Thomas Nash allusions. Contemporary, you mean during the time? Not, not anyone 
that I know of spoke about him in print, except for Gabriel and Richard Harvey and uh, Joseph Hall, who was writing as Litchfield. Uh, Barnaby Barnes contributed to some of Harvey's pamphlets and had something to say. And there might've been one or two other people associated with Harvey. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's not anything that sounds like a real conversation between Nash and some other friends of his. In fact, some of Oxford's voices he, were, were begging uh, Thomas Watson to come, come to Robert Greene's defense. Well, Robert, unfortunately, Watson died about a week later, so he couldn't do that. Another voice berates, not berates, but he begs Edmund Spencer, why are you friends with this idiot? But Spencer was a friend of Gabriel Harvey, and he actually had some very loyal friends, except for his inability to bow down far enough to an earl and to actually think he was a, an equal. That was his error. That ruined his reputation. Renee Euchner is looking for a recommendation. Are there other good sources for De Vere's poetry? The last thing in the book is a, what I call the summation. And I have lists of all of Oxford's work works as I determine them by genre. So there's a list of all of his um, narrative poems, including those by Shakespeare. Uh, there's a list of his prose stories, a list of his plays and so on. So if you want to read what De Vere wrote, there's your list and you can just take that and get on EEBO or uh, lately the University of Michigan has been terrific at putting up in, in the original spelling, actually, a lot of works from that period. So you can get them for nothing right online. It's just a wonderful service. That's the end of the questions and we are over time. So I would just like everyone to say thank you to Bob and I would like to express my gratitude. You're so welcome. And I want to thank everyone for spending their Saturday with me. It was, it was great.